Well, last week we looked at pressing forward, grabbing hold of all that Jesus had for us, all that we could possibly get. How many of you guys went and tried to find one of those money machines where you get in it where all the money blows around? I really would like, I'm up for the challenge. If anybody knows where I can find one of those, I'm, I'm ready for it. But, but we're, we're, uh, we're to press toward this goal, right? Press toward this goal that, that Paul told us was this, it's Christ-like now, here on earth, and that when we do that, there's a prize, and that prize is being Christ-like in heaven. We have this upward call of God in Christ Jesus, and so today, Paul kind of continues along those lines of this upward call. What does that mean, and what does it look like for the people of God? If you want to turn to Philippians chapter seven, chapter 3, verse 17 to 21, it says, Brethren, Join in following my example and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earth earthly things for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await the savior the lord jesus christ who will transform our lowly body that it might be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself so we see a clear distinction of two types of people here Paul says there's those who are actually enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, as you go around and you meet people, there's probably not a lot of people that proclaim to be an enemy of the cross of Christ. It's probably a pretty select few that would admit that. But he says we have those. And then we have citizens of heaven. He says you're one or the other. You're an enemy of the cross or you're a citizen of heaven. You know, there's things that you can clearly separate, clearly differentiate without there being any kind of uh, gray area. And then there's other things where you can kind of separate into two categories and you kind of have some, some gray, right? Where you're like, well, this, this could fit over there. It could fit over there. Uh, we have this, this system at home that we made for when we can't think of anything to do because we're actually a very indecisive family as far as coming in agreement. And so we made these, first had this idea of putting all these different activities on popsicle sticks and then you color the end for what category it is. Well, it was easy to come up with the things to write on sticks, but then, my goodness, try to put them in categories. You know, it's like, well, that could be outdoor, that could be this, that, you know, it's like, it's, sometimes it's a gray area. You're like, can we make it two or three colors? And then that complicates the system even more. Sometimes you just can't differentiate. It, it, you got to find out a little more criteria, a little more information. And right now, if we were to take this room and we were going to say, all right, everybody that can roll their tongue, you know, not everybody can do that, where you make your tongue kind of loop like that. Not everybody can do it. You either can do it or you can't, right? There's not an in-between. If you kind of halfway do it, it means you didn't do it. We could kind of differentiate and be like, if you can roll your tongue, go over there. If you cannot roll your tongue, go over there. It'd be pretty distinct, pretty easy. We just look. It is or it isn't. And we can separate the people. Now, if we were to say, okay, now let's separate people who can sing and who cannot sing. Right? Truth be told, everybody can sing. But, but if we're trying to make a group of who is good at singing, right, who is not good at singing, well, now there's not a clear distinction, right? There could be some gray area, and what we would need is, what do we do about all these people that can kind of sing? See, we need some criteria, like what do you want to use to determine what is good? Or we need some kind of meter, or we need to try and check and see if people uh, can hold a tune, if they're in pitch, if they can sing in the right key. What are we using to determine if it's good or if it's not good, we need more information. This is where we are in Philippians. Paul wants you to know that there are two kinds of people. 
There's two kinds of people, and you've got to know the criteria to actually know what kind of person they actually are. Right? Because there's a lot of people that are like, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, he seems pretty good. Right? He seems like, I mean, he says he's a citizen of heaven. Surely he is, right? I mean, why would he lie about that? Uh, again, not too many people are admitting that they're an enemy of the cross. You need to know the criteria to know where people actually fit. And he starts by saying in verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk so you have us for a pattern. Now, you may be thinking right now that, you know, you've, you've probably heard that we're not really supposed to follow people, right? You're supposed to follow Jesus. We say that a lot in the church. Like, you don't follow people, you follow Jesus. Uh, is this completely true? That we don't follow people, we only follow Jesus? I mean, I get the idea behind it. I get why we say it. But I don't think that it's actually a proper way to look at things. Paul says at least four different times in four different letters that he wrote to the church. He says something about following him. In 2 Thessalonians 3.7 he says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Or in 1 Thessalonians 1.6 he said, You became imitators of us and the Lord. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's one of the most popular ones. And then here he's saying, join in following my example. There's other people already doing it. Join along in them and take note of those who so walk. Those who do this already. Those who are already following my example, take note of those people. Don't forget who they are. You might need those people. You have a pattern in us for you to follow. These are some pretty bold statements. These are some kind of statements we don't hear from modern Christians, right? Follow me. And when I think about that, could it be that Paul so intensely pursued Jesus, this pressing forward, this grabbing all that he could possibly get, that he was so confident in his, in his closeness to Christ, he was so confident in it, and he so depended on the spirit that he could say, follow me, and I'll lead you to him. Right? It's, it's, sometimes he said it, sometimes it's just implied, just to follow me. But, but why could Paul say this? Could it be that today Christians don't say this because they don't want the responsibility or the accountability in saying, follow me? Because that means now if you're following me as I follow Christ, it means I actually really have to follow Christ. I actually really have to try to be obedient to the Spirit, to read the Scriptures, to pray, to live like Jesus would live and not be mean to people. Right? Because that's, I mean, you've got to be careful. If you're going to say that, people are, somebody's going to follow you. But here's the thing, somebody's already following you. Okay? But if we're going to proclaim it like Paul did, you better be ready because the criticism is going to come. That's Somebody will call you a hypocrite. Guaranteed. If you put it on Facebook today, like, listen, follow me as I follow Jesus, you'll probably have a, somebody, before you can get it posted, will send you a message and be like, you're a hypocrite. Why would I follow you? You did this. You did that. But is it because we don't want the responsibility? Is it because we don't want... The, accountabil the accountability of, of following Jesus ourselves in a way that is modeled for others to follow. Because Paul seems to lean toward uh, not just follow me, not just follow Jesus, but a little bit of both. He seems to lean toward a, you know what, you need to follow Jesus, but sometimes in the way that you follow Jesus is by following the examples of others who are following Jesus that are showing you, modeling for you how you can follow him. Paul kind of says, let's do a little bit of both. And again, it's where people don't want responsibility and accountability. How many times do we see professional athletes or movie stars, all these people that will publicly proclaim, I am not a role model? Right? I know people are looking up to me, they shouldn't be, because I'm not a role model. If you remember back in 
the two th early 2000s, or maybe even been the late 90s, Charles Barkley had a commercial where he made this definitive statement. He came on the camera and he said, I am not a role model. He said, I'm not paid to be a role model. He said, I am paid to wreak havoc on the basketball court. Parents should be role models. Just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what, Charles, you're right. You're not a very good role model. You're kind of a knucklehead, right? But, but, but he makes this statement, and why was he making this statement? It was because at that time, he acted like such a fool, he was getting a lot of heat about, man, my kids look up to you. Should you be acting like that when, when kids are looking to you as their role model? There's a bit of truth to this. I mean, parents should be role models, amen? I mean, that's part of our problem in America, is that parents aren't role models. They absolutely should be. But if we say that we don't want to be a role model, that's not preventing people from following us and modeling after what we do. It's not at all. It's, it doesn't prevent anybody from seeing what we do and copying it. Most of society is looking for something to follow, someone to be like. Right? It's how we learn. Right? Kids learn things by watching mom and dad. They say things by listening to mom and dad. Right? That's why when we hear a little kid say something and the parent's like, well, I don't know where they got that from. I'm like, well, I do. From you. I mean, I've heard you say it. You don't even realize what's going on. But, but when we think about these people who are searching and they're looking for someone to follow. They're looking for someone to be like. Even if they know Jesus, I want to tell you that they're still searching for someone to follow. Right? Because there's someone who's farther along in their walk that's a little more advanced, that's a little closer to Jesus than what you are. And when you look at them, hopefully there is a desire to kind of be like that person. Okay? Now, get me here. I'm not saying to model your life like they're your goal. But like, man, he really, he really seems to have a knowledge of the word. I should, like, it's good for me to desire that. So, hey, how do you get this? What do you do? What's, how do you study? How often do you read? Like, how do I get this? How do you, how do you pray? I want to pray. Like, there's, it's okay to desire those things. Again, it's not that we're trying to be an exact replica of that person. But if they're an example of how we can get closer to Christ, man, we should follow that. We should ask them, pursue what they are doing. So when they look at us, when people look at me and you, are they seeing Jesus? Are they seeing Jesus? Are they seeing a reflection of what he looks like? Now, I know the, the automatic answer is, well, well, not fully. I'm not perfect. I'm not saying, are you perfect? I'm saying if someone follows you around, are they seeing anything that looks like Jesus? Because they should be. They should be. Do you have the boldness to say, follow me as I follow Christ? Because we should. I mean, I know you maybe don't want to. I'm not asking if you want to. I'm saying we should. You don't want to because you may not want the accountability. You may not want the responsibility you may not want the headache, but you know what? You should already be desiring to know Christ more, to be more like him, to follow him closely. And, you know, it's like we were singing earlier, like, man, Lord, I'm not enough unless you come. Like, this is it. This is what I want. It's what I desire is to be where you are, to know you more. And so if you're desiring that for yourself, if you're pursuing that for yourself, shouldn't we have the boldness to say, follow me as I follow Christ? And notice it's the, as I follow Christ, it's, 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 look at the things in me that are Christ-like and model those. The things that aren't, you know, maybe you shouldn't model those, but Paul says, follow my example and those who walk as I do. The others as well. You notice this isn't just Paul. Because there's a lot of people that would like to say, well, you're the pastor, you're paid. You're literally paid to follow Jesus. And it's like, no, I'm not. I'm actually not paid to follow Jesus. I'm paid to 
preach the word and equip the saints. I'm, I'm paid to, literally paid to tell you what the word says about what you should be doing in your life. That's it. That's, that's, the, that's the main part of a pastor to kind of lead the way, to show you. I do need to be an example for myself, but, but Paul says it's not just me. It's not just the one speaking the message, but look around and find the others. And you should also pick out in them what are they doing that you can model. We're supposed to be role models. You know that? We're supposed to be, every one of us. You know what a role model is by definition? It is a person whose behavior, their example, their success can be copied, emulated by others, especially younger people. And when you apply that to the spiritual state, we're not talking about younger in age, we're talking about younger in spiritual maturity. We ought to be in a way where our behavior, our example, our success can be copied, can be followed, can be emulated by those who are younger in the faith than what we are. They ought to be able to follow. So it's important that people see this in you. Right? There's already way too much of the other examples in the world. He goes on to tell us in verse 18, he says, For many, say many, many, okay, many walk of whom I have told you often. This isn't the first time they've heard this. Paul's like, I tell you about these people all the time. I've told you a couple of times already in this letter, and here I am coming back around again. And he says, and now I tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame who set their mind on earthly things. He talks to these people that he says are enemies of the cross of Christ. And do you notice how his response is? I've, I've told you about these people a few times, but even right now I'm telling you about them and I'm weeping. Right? I'm heartbroken about these people. When we think about the enemies of the cross, when we think about these people these who we think they could be those who have spoken against the saving power of the cross. They could be those that deny the resurrection and salvation that was purchased at the cross. But it also can just be those who just lead people away from Jesus in general. By their words, by their actions. Sometimes it could be intentional, sometimes it could be unintentional. But when we think about these people, here's what we need to consider. Are we, are we automatically consumed with anger? And we want to just them to get what they deserve and get what's due to them. For them to be put in their place. For them to possibly even lose their life for what they have done. Is that where we are or are we moved to weeping by the compassion of God? Knowing that these people too are just lost souls who are in need of being saved. The enemies of the cross, listen. Enemies of the cross are people with souls who need to be saved. Jesus died for them just as he died for us. This is the heart of God that Paul has where he's weeping for these people. He's told about them over and over. You know what it means? If he's told about them over and over, they've probably been a little bit of a thorn in his side. They probably caused him some problems, cost him a lot of time. Yet he weeps for them, for their very souls. He says they're important too, guys. 2 Peter 3.9 tells us the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. He's patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's desire is that all, Everyone would come to repentance, turn away from their sin, and give their life to him. Because he's the giver of life, amen? But it says the enemies of the cross. This is why we should be heartbroken, guys. It says that their end is destruction. Their end is destruction. This means their eternity is one of ruin, right? Their eternity is one they will spend it forever separated from God. 
Complete separation. I don't know if we realize, again, how big of a deal that is. Complete separation. God's the one that brings the rain. Right? God's the one that causes the sun to rise. And we're talking complete separation. Forever. Without Him. All that is good is from God. And, and as a matter of fact, we don't even realize to the degree that the Holy Spirit is suppressing the evil in this world. You know, when we see things totally cut loose, we're like, it can't get any worse than this. Oh, it can. If the Holy Spirit was to say, I'm out of here, that would be as bad as it can get. That's what hell's going to be like. As bad as it can get, because he is not going to be present. He will be absent. When we think about this, this is a big deal because hell is not going to be a party with your friends. There's people that really think that. It's going to be misery forever with no end. No end. Listen, no relief. No way out. There will be no way of escape. That's the end of the people who are the enemies of the cross. That's why Paul's heartbroken. He's like, why would I want anybody to be in that place. No matter what they've done. Why would I want them to be in that place? This should break our hearts. You know there's some that would say they don't deserve that kind of grace. And I can stand here and say neither do I. I don't deserve it either. But God offers it and he says here it is. If you'll take it. If you'll take it it's here for you. Pray for these enemies of the cross that they would know the living God. We ought to be heartbroken over this. He says their God is their belly. Yeah, their God is their belly. This, this isn't just speaking of like they like to eat a lot, okay? Enemies of the cross are not all overweight. Plenty of them are thin, okay? It's not about that. He's saying this speaks of, of their living to please themselves by feeding their uncontrollable appetite for sin. Their God is their belly. Their appetite for the sins, for the lusts of the flesh, for, for doing the things that gratify our sinful nature, that's their God. It's what they bow to. They focus on the things of the world so much that they worship this appetite as though it's their God. It's what they think about. It's all they talk about. It's all they do. It's all that life is to them. He says that their glory is their shame. Their glory is their shame. This is when they brag about the things that they should be ashamed of, right? They're proud of sin. Listen, I used to be that guy. I used to brag about all the things I did, all the stupid things I did because I wanted to be cool. And now I realize how moronic that really was. It's really not that cool to glory in your shame and your sin. And... This is, you know, guys who brag about how many women they sleep with. This is what he's talking about. Their glory is their shame. This is the business owner that talks with all of his other buddies at the, the business meeting about how, how he ripped people off, right? How he snuck that lemon car right on by him and they had no idea and he got full value for it. And it's, it's, it's the people that were gathered around our governor smiling and laughing and Clapping as he signs this full-term abortion bill. These are people that are, their glory is their shame, right? They're in the spotlight. They're getting praise. They're, wow, look at you how great you are. It's their shame is what the Word of God tells us. This is about the homosexuals that were parading the streets of Chicago, barely dressed in anything that's decent that wouldn't be allowed anywhere, handing out candy to little kids, promoting ungodly and unnatural lifestyles. Their glory is their shame. These all get some kind of temporary glory for what they've done. Somebody somewhere is saying, good for you. You did, that is awesome. You are the man, right? Look at how great you are. Look at what you accomplished. I'm proud of you. Somewhere, someone's impressed. But these are the exact things that will be their shame and will result in and the judgment of God upon their lives. Amen. They're the exact things, unless they turn, repent, and give their life to Him. They all still have a chance. 
They're alive if they got breath in their lungs. They've still got a chance. We ought to pray for them. He says their mind is on earthly things. This right here is where the problem lies. Their mind is on earthly things. Listen, we all get caught up in sin and trouble when our mind is fixed on earthly things. Been there, done that. Right? You get focused on that. You get the tunnel vision about the earthly things. Next thing you know, you've done something that you shouldn't have done, and you know it. We think about this, this focus, this attention, these temporary feel-good things. It says when we're in that place, our glory is our shame, our God is our belly, our end is destruction. And these are the people that should say, I am not a role model. But unfortunately, in our society, they're the people that are put on the newspaper and put on the TV and get all the publicity, and they're the people that everybody wants to talk about. You know why Colin Kaepernick's so popular? Because we keep talking about him. You know, it's like, who is this guy, and why does he have so much power? Because we keep talking about him. Because we keep putting him in the paper, because we keep making a big deal about everything he says and does, and all the people that go on and rant and trash him and talk about him on Facebook for days and weeks and months after he does something, that's why he does another thing. Right? We feed into these very things. Our society feeds into these systems of being focused on these earthly things. And these are the people that should say, you know what? I'm not a role model, but the thing is, what they're doing is easy. And when what you're doing is easy, you don't mind people following you, right? Because you know what? I got this all day long. It's no sweat off my back because we all can easily follow our sinful fleshly desires day after day. It's no big deal. It's not hard to do. It's real easy to say, sure, follow me. Where are the good, godly role models at in this life? Where are they at? Because these are the people that we should be gathered around. These are the people in the world today that we should be gathered around and say, how can I follow them? How can I be more like them? It's the people that are in churches all around the world worshiping Jesus today. Paul says that for them, Philippians 3.20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. Praise God for that. Amen. This Greek word here for citizenship is polituma. Polituma. It means colony or foreigners. It means colony of foreigners or relocated veterans. And this purpose of this colony would be uh, they would be established as a way to, uh, to spread the ways of the conquering country into the conquered country. So this idea was to change the country to reflect the culture, the customs, the laws of the dominant country. Philippi, who this letter was written to, they were a polituma. Okay? They got this. They understood this. That's why Paul used this word to speak to them because they were a Roman colony that was not in Rome. So they kind of got this. They understood what it was like. They were there to influence those around them with Roman culture with Roman customs, with Roman laws. And Paul tells them that even though you live in Philippi, even though you have these Roman rights, these Roman uh, laws that you can rely on, you've got to remember that you, the people in the church, the people I'm writing this letter to, you've got something greater than that, right? Because being Roman was the greatest. And he's like, you got something even greater than that. You are citizens of heaven, right? You have the privileges of, of heaven, and that's who you really belong to. Not Philippi, not Rome, but God Almighty in heaven. These were God's people who he placed in that town, in that area, to spread the ways of the kingdom of heaven. Right? And they say, just like the Roman would never forget that they belong to Rome, you must never forget that if you're a citizen of heaven, that you belong to heaven. Wherever you're at, wherever you go, you belong to heaven. That does not change. That's where you belong. He says your conduct should match your citizenship. Christians should be influencing them or those around them 
with heavenly culture, with heavenly customs, with heavenly laws. Don't we first have to be following them ourselves? Don't we have to display, I'm a citizen of heaven? We have to be like these people that Paul speaks of, these examples who lead people to Jesus. Note those who so walk, right? Take notice of those who are actually living like they belong to heaven. Take note of those who are walking like they are citizens of heaven. Follow them as they follow Jesus, and then you be that role model for someone else. You be that person. Do you know that when we do this, do you know that it's okay to admit to somebody that, you know what, I messed up there, don't, don't follow that, right? I said something I shouldn't have said, I'm sorry, don't, don't copy that, right? Don't take that from me. Do you know that letting them know that you repent and that you did something wrong, do you know that that's a good thing for other Christians to be able to copy? Do you know that's part of the problem with Christianity is everybody's perfect? Everybody's got it all together, and so when we get together, we all have to hide our sin and our imperfections because we don't want to be the weak one, right? Because if I let you know that I actually have struggles in my life and that I'm not perfect, then well, then you won't come and ask me for help anymore. It's like, you know what? I would tell you that if that person's following Christ, that's exactly the person that you should go and ask help for. The person who's willing to admit that they have their own faults, their own failures, their own struggles, but you know what? But I'm pressing forward. But you know what? I'm pursuing God. In spite of my imperfections, I'm pressing forward. That's the exact person you should go and follow. It's the exact person you should look up to. Follow me as I follow Christ. Listen, you know, authenticity is what people are looking for. Authenticity is what people are looking for. I want the real deal. I want to know the real story. People aren't coming to church nowadays because they're not getting authenticity. That doesn't just apply to here. I'm saying that applies everywhere. People are not coming to church because they don't feel like they're getting authenticity. They feel like they're getting the fake, hey, how are you? Glad you're here. I'm really not. Because you're probably sitting in my seat. How much money are you giving today? Right? I've had talks with people just this last week that... They've not known of a few things that I consider to be pretty elementary to the faith, and that's not anything bad on their part. It's because the church is so focused on how many people are here, how much money did they give, how many people did we get saved today. And by get saved today, all they mean is that the people that responded to the altar or that prayed a prayer, not that it had any kind of life change. We don't care about that. We just care about, are they going to come back next week? Are they going to give next week? And did they fill out a card saying, I gave my life to Jesus? But what about the part where we are the example for them to follow? What about the part where we actually grab their hand or put our arm around their shoulder and say, you know what? This is pretty tough. Following the world's easy. This is tough, but I'll walk it with you. I'm here with you. We as a body are here for you and with you and will go with you. What about all that stuff? See, because we're not doing that in the church, and that's why there are people who are saved sitting in churches for years and years and years and don't even know the elementary principles of Christ. It's because they got their place. We got them locked in. They always sit in that pew, in that seat. They always give. We don't need to do anything with them. Like, who else is coming? Right? Let's focus on them. You know, our problem as elders is that our job is really to shepherd the flock. But too often it's looked at as our job is to promote the church and to grow the church. It's not. It's to take care of the ones that actually do come. We're to take care of the ones that are here in whatever way, shape, or form we can. What can we do to help you today? And if we could get that as a church, guys, I'm telling you, we would tr see the world transformed. It'd be changed because people want authenticity. They're looking for that stuff. They just don't know where they can get it. Some of them haven't met it yet. They haven't encountered it. And I pray to God that this be a place where they can encounter that. With me, with our elders, and with all of you. I pray that this could be that place. 
share what we do get right, and let our eyes be on heaven. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2 says, Then you were raised with Christ. If you were, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Seating, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. Listen, what that means to be fixed, have our eyes fixed on him. This is, this is locked in, right? This is, man, that's, that's all that I'm, I'm looking for. That's, I'm, I'm looking through the, anybody ever tried to look through a set of binoculars or a telescope or something and you can't find the thing you're looking for? Marissa had her telescope out trying to show me Saturn one time, whenever that was, a few weeks ago. And I had that thing, and somehow it got bumped. And I'm like, all I see is black. And I'm like moving it like... I'm like, I do not see it anywhere, right? And then she's like, I had it right on there. Like, let me get it back on there. Don't touch anything. And so I come back over. She had it locked in. And I look at it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, there it is. I see when it's when you're already locked in, I mean it's pretty easy to focus on it. But but sometimes we're just like, eh, it's around here somewhere. You know, looking through a, a hole that big. And you know, we gotta get locked in on Jesus. When you got a, a lens that's that big and you get it locked in on Jesus, man, you're done looking. Right? The search is over. Once we found Saturn, I was like, that's amazing. That looks really cool. I'm done. I don't need to look around. Do you want to see these other stars? No, I don't care. I found what I was looking for. Right? I found the thing that was really cool that I was really searching for. We've got to get locked in. He tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. Are we eagerly waiting for the Savior? Because it says that when he comes, he will transform our lowly body so that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Amen? According to to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. He's able to subdue all things to himself. Are we eagerly waiting for the Savior? You know, this is kind of like patiently, impatiently waiting. It's kind of what that's like, eagerly waiting. I'm patiently, impatiently waiting. Okay, I'm the kind of guy, if you're coming to my house, and you're going to be there at 7. I know you're not going to be there till about 7, but started at about 6.50. I've got the blinds open, and I'm like standing by the window. Right? And if I go do something, I come back, and I'm like, you're not here yet? I'm like patiently, impatiently waiting. It's not even time for you to be there yet, but I'm anticipating it. And so I'm like, well, I know that I need to wait, but I'm also excited. And so I'm like, I'm like kind of torn between being patient and impatient, and I keep going and looking because I know that it's getting close, but, but I know it's not quite time yet, and, and so I'm kind of torn. This is how we should be with Jesus, right? We've got to be ready because he could appear at any time. He could be a few minutes early, right? right? We don't know. Only the Father knows the day and the hour, right? We don't know. We kind of got an idea, but we don't really know, so I'm like, I, I can't wait for it. Like, I'm, I'm impatient, but, but at the same time, I know that i got to wait. Because it's not really quite time yet. We should be constantly checking and looking and wondering. Like, man, what do you, do you think? Like, like, is he the kind of guy that shows up a little bit early? Like, do you think he wants to surprise me? Like, we should be constantly looking, constantly waiting, constantly uh, wondering about him. He told us in Revelation 22, verse 20 and 21, the very end of the Bible, is what it says. He, Jesus, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Right? He says, I'm coming quickly. Are we eagerly awaiting? Right? Are we impatiently, patiently waiting for his return? We're told in, in verse 1, Chapter 1, verse 7, that we'll see him coming on the clouds. Right? It says that every eye will see him. You guys know that? You ever heard people like, they kind of joke, but they're kind of serious about, if, am I going to miss it? It says every eye will see him. Every single eye will see him. You ever wonder about what about, what about the guy that can't see? I think his eyes are going to be opened at that moment. I think the blindness is going to be gone like that. He's going to know at that moment he's going to be able to see. 
that says every eye will see him. In Matthew chapter 24, it says that he will come like lightning from the east to the west. Right? He's going to come like lightning. That doesn't mean lightning fast. It means like you can see lightning from a long distance off. And the effects of it can be seen minutes later sometimes. He's going to come like lightning. And we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, those who don't know him and that oppose him, they'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They'll be separated from the presence of the Lord and from his power, the glory of his power. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Do you want to know what that's going to sound like? <laughs> when the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Hallelujah. You ever wonder about that? There's your answer. They rise first. Listen, they get there before we do. They, they die. They live before us and they die before us. They get to Jesus first. It's only fair. Right? God is a just God. They get there first. It says, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. Like that's going to be it, guys. At that point, we will always be with the Lord. I mean, I don't know about you, but this, this story doesn't seem to be able to get any better. Lost loved ones who are in Christ, risen to life. I get to fly and get caught up to them and to Jesus in the air after he does some kind of shout and he's got an angel and a trumpet with him and it's going to be a great scene. This is, I mean, this is going really great and then I get to be with him forever, right? There's no end to this. We'll always be with him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, and we shall be changed. Yes. Hallelujah. Who's looking forward to that? Amen. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on the incorruptible. And this mortal must put on immortality. Man, we will be made whole, completely immortal, right? Incorruptible. You know what? The reason we're corrupted is because of sin. So this, what this is saying is there will be no more sin affecting you, your body, your friends, your family. There will be no more sin. We will be incorruptible. It won't be possible because its presence will not be there. We will be immortal. We'll never die. Praise the Lord. And we're going to be with him forever. You see how this builds on itself? How amazing this is? And then in Revelation chapter 21... He says, and God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. Every single tear. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Sounds pretty good, right? There will be no more pain. All those in pain said hallelujah. And the former things have passed away. That's it. This is a fresh, fresh start right here. Made whole, no sin, with Jesus forever, in heaven. Praise the Lord. So Paul was saying that if you are a citizen of heaven, if you belong to Jesus, these are the things that our mind should be on. These are the things our mind should be on. Not on the things of this world, but on the things of eternity. So as we get ready to open up the altars, if you would stand to your feet. And I want you to just ponder just these few things. Just think about these and, 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 and consider how God would have you respond or, or, or seek him about them today. If you would close your eyes. And what I want you to do is I, I talk about these things. I just want you to, if, if God's kind of tugging on your heart, if he's kind of speaking to you about one of these things, I want you to get locked in on it. Like we were talking about, I want your focus to just... Be on it, these things right here that God may be speaking to you. 
Which citizenship is influencing you the most? Is it your earthly one being a citizen of the United States of America or is it your heavenly one? Which one of these citizenships is affecting you and influencing you the most? I think if we're being honest on most days, most people would say the temporal. The citizenship of this world, it, it influences me the most because of the things that, that happen in my life that it's easy to get pulled away from God. I'm telling you that today, the Lord wants to bring healing. He wants to bring restoration. He wants to uh, cancel the assignment of the enemy on your life. And he wants to bring you to a place where you can focus on him, where you can give it all to him in spite of the things that remain. If that's you, I want you to come forward. Give that to the Lord this morning. Second thing to consider, whose example are you following? Whose example are you following? Are you, are you looking at those who follow Christ, like, like Paul said, and making note of those, and like, man, I really need to get with this guy and see. How did you get to the point where you pray like that? How did you get to the point where you're uh, so encouraging? How did you get to the point where you... You tend to always see things uh, from, a, from God's perspective instead of the world's perspective. Maybe you need to seek that out in a person that you've seen it in. Whose example are you following? Is there a change that needs to be made? Are you following people who their, their focus is the world? And because they are, then that's what your desires are. Is that something you need to bring to the Lord this morning? The third thing is, what kind of an example are you setting? Right? What kind of example are you setting? I'll tell you that the thing that we need to focus on in that right here is, am I going after Jesus? And then if I am, am I being real? Am I being authentic with myself, with him, with those around me, those that are following me? What kind of example are you setting? Find joy in being a role model. Let that push you. Let that... That, that create a desire in you to do more, to be greater. And the last thing is, how do you feel about those people who are enemies of the cross? What's your heart really like toward those people? Those who don't know Jesus, find yourself with, with angst and with anger, with, with uh, bitterness toward people who are in that place, what I want you to do is just come forward and, and lay it down at the altar. I want you to just give it to the Lord and say, God, this morning, Holy Spirit, I need the Father's heart on this. I need the Father's heart. I need to not see people the way that I see them, but I need to see them the way that you do. I believe he'll give that to you. I believe that he'll remove that root of bitterness if you'll just repent and give it to him this morning. And so right now we're going to open up the altars for, for prayer. If you got some stuff you want to lay down and give to the Lord this morning, please come and do so. If you'd like somebody to stand in faith and pray with you, just grab me and I'll, I'll be happy to pray with you. Just thank you, Jesus, for your power, for your might. Lord, we thank you that your spirit is present. Hallelujah, Lord. We got a God who is good, a God who is victorious, who is overcoming, a God who can bring divine healing in our lives in every aspect. We got a God who desires to be with us. And Lord, as we worship you right now, Lord, we just pray that our hearts would be laid bare before you. Lord, reveal if there is any wickedness within us. Reveal if there are any of these topics, any of these things that we've read in the scriptures by Paul's words or that you spoke. If there's any of these that apply to us that we need to change, Lord, we just pray that your spirit would feel the freedom to come and bring change and transform our lives. We give it all to you this morning in Jesus' name.